morning, everyone. How are you? Oh, nobody is doing well today. Everybody is like under the weather. Am I right? So uh, we are not having the coldest weather that we've had so far this year, but I think the humidity has just seeped into everybody's bones. Am I right? This makes it feel so much colder. But uh, it's great to be here in the Lord's house, and uh, especially uh, now that the music has ended and the announcements have begun, uh, I will do my best as the Pied Piper to just bring everybody in. First, let's begin. I think there is a birthday boy out in the uh, Narthex somewhere. Maybe he can hear my voice. His name is Logan Byro. So maybe, yeah, come on in, Logan, so we can sing to you. And the other birthday person is Karen Queen. I know. So Karen outpaces me today. She will turn a year older than, no, not today, uh, the 7th. Okay. So do we have any other birthdays to celebrate today other than the ones that I have just mentioned? No? Okay. Any anniversaries that I have not remembered? Okay. Good to know. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's do a happy birthday to Karen and to Logan. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to uh, pause for just a moment and invite Reverend Ann to come over. She has a few guests she would like to recognize this morning. You've got to use this microphone or that one. Yeah, that one right there. Oh, my goodness. It is my honor to introduce uh, our um, first time worshipers and our special guest, um, Dr. Tremieu and Mrs. Tremieu, and then Reverend Lainey Jenkins. And the, especially uh, those two ladies are from the uh, Georgia Disciples Women's uh, Ministries, and they are president and also director, and right after the church, and it is a um, Q&A session for our FCCA ladies group. So please stay for just for a few minutes to have a questions and answer session. And we are so Glad and so privileged to have all three of you to come and worship with us. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I will add to that, uh, Dr. Trimue uh, has taught at Bright Divinity School as well as at Candler School of Theology at Emory and, and other places. So you'll want to get a chance to get to know him if you like. He, uh, I believe you guys are members at Ray of Hope Christian Church and uh, have served with us and others and Joe Williams uh, on the Reconciliation Commission for the Georgia region in the past. So glad to have you with us today, especially during this month of uh, black history. So thank you and welcome. And now on to the announcements very quickly. So as usual, we continue to uh, bring non-perishable food items for networks. And as I think everybody knows, there's a place right out there in the narthex where we collect those and have those uh, ready. And now uh, Beth Sheffer has been, uh, has volunteered generously to come and to help take those items over to networks every week. We've been talking for a while about the blankets for the unhoused people in Atlanta. Our friends at Holy Cross uh, Catholic Church have some friars that go down and work with people and bring them blankets and so forth. They have uh, extended their gratitude to us for continuing to supply them with blankets. But they ask if you have any gently used or new coats that you don't need that you can give. Coats are needed and also I should have added sleeping bags. If you have some weatherproof sleeping bags that are, you're not needing or using anymore, they can definitely use those. Uh, and of course, we continue to add uh, to offer the math tutoring on Sunday mornings. I think, Kirk, you had two guests, sorry, two, two students and two parents there. So wonderful uh, outreach uh, of ours here on Sunday mornings. Next slide, please. There we go. 
The nursery project is underway, and if you haven't yet told anybody that you're interested in working with and helping get that uh, done, I would suggest you get in touch with Sherry Richardson and, uh, or Diane Holiday or Marsha Moore, the Women of Light, the CWF, and so forth, because they are taking that project on and it's going to be up and ready. Speaking of which, we have a baby shower next Sunday. We're ready to welcome those twins into the world almost as much as you are. <laughs> next slide, please. So here we, here we have the February calendar at a glance. Again, the Weitzel baby shower next Sunday. Uh, and then a couple days after that, the Tucker Community Singers resumes their practice here on Tuesday nights. Uh, I think that's going to be a really great season. This is going to be a great season uh, because of the Broadway numbers. And then, of course, on Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Can you believe that we are ready, already, for the Advent season? And we just finished... I'm no, sorry, Lent. We just finished Advent, right? So here we are. Uh, and we will have our usual drop-in between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. For those of you who would like to come during the daylight hours, we will have it set up here, of course, and we will be on hand for the ashes and the communion and so forth. We will also have the ashes and communion Wednesday night for those who come to Bible study, handbell practice, and choir practice. Uh, let's see. On the 18th, the choir is going to t travel to Tucker Wellness and minister to the people there. It's not performing, it's ministering, right? And they're going to sing, but they're going to do more than just sing. They're going to bring some joy. They're going to probably play kazoos and stuff. Oh, oh, by the way, any one of you who wants to join them can join them. That's right. And if you don't have to sing, you can play the kazoo or something, right? Yeah, I know, I, I was getting to that, but yes. So they will be interacting with the residents, playing games, and it's, it's more than just singing. It's going to be a, a very interactive program, and Reverend Ann can tell you all about that. I want to pause and thank everyone. Uh, I apologize. I know I'm going to forget a name or two here and there, and I apologize for that, but everyone who came for our two sort of uh, impromptu emergency work days, I realize that many people have to work and so forth, so... Those who could came, and those who couldn't, I'm sure you prayed for us. But uh, thank you to everyone who was involved in cleaning up after the pipe explosion downstairs and so forth. And you'll see that there's a large dumpster behind the church. You can see it right through the narthex, through the back windows there, of uh, a lot of stuff that got dumped in there. But I do have to especially mention Sean Stone, our property chair, who probably put in about 30 hours over the last two or three weeks and as a volunteer, you know, and so when you see Sean, please give him some kudos about that. Uh, and so looking ahead to March 17th will be our cleanup Sunday. That'll be, a, that's a Sunday. That means we will come in our blue jeans and t-shirts and we will worship and then we will eat and then we will clean. Okay. And finally, uh, we'll start advertising the regional assembly, which is coming up in April at the end of April, and it's going to be in Macon, and um, that's why Ann was meeting with Reverend Laney and, and Mrs. Tremu and, and a number of ladies this weekend to plan activities for the Women's Commission, and I think worship as well. So we're going to have a great representation down there. It's going to be a wonderful experience. If you've never been to Regional Assembly, it's time to, to see what it's all about. All right, next slide, please. Uh, Quickly, we have been asking, there's a sign-up out in the narthex, but here's some areas where we might use your talent, uh, or I should say you might offer your talents and gifts to the Lord in the service of our church. Uh, here's, just very quickly, uh, PowerPoint skills to assist with making worship slides, uh, volunteers to come and help answer the phone in the office, especially on days when it's busy, um, Sound booth, maybe, is there anybody who's interested in learning how to run the sound system and do the lights and the video and all that kind of stuff? If you are, we could use your assistance. Uh, I've already mentioned networks, and Beth has already stepped up for that. And, of course, PR team, which is a fancy way of saying that from time to time, when we have something we want to promote in our community, if you'll grab some, some flyers, and when you go to the coffee shop, when you go to various places that have bulletin boards, such as restaurants, if you take some of those and put them out there, it's a, another great way to spread the word. 
Okay, let's see. What else do we have here slide-wise? Next one, please. All righty. Uh, our usual Wednesday night activities, handbells and Bible study at 6. We continue with mere Christianity. And then choir practice at 7. And finally, a word of thanks this morning to Gail Parnell, my favorite Martian, who went to Publix and picked up the goodies and brought them and deposited them in the narthex. So thanks to um, Gail, we can all now have our daily bread. Okay. On that note, uh, yes, Lori? Yes. Super. Thank you so much. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you. Lori Harrison. Uh, okay. Wonderful. So Lori's, for the benefit of those who are online, they probably didn't hear that because there's not a microphone nearby. I'll just repeat it. So Lori Harrison, Lilburn Women's Club uh, in outreach, where she was the secretary for the last two years, or in charge of outreach, donated over 100 of the thermal emergency rescue blankets to the unhoused back in December, and now has a, a supply of 25 or so that we can pass on to the uh, friars who'll be working downtown, so wonderful. That in itself is an act of worship, helping those who are in need. But now let us turn our attention towards our Heavenly Father as we now proceed with our time of worship. choose love in the midst of pain sorrow falling down like rain I await the sun again I choose love I choose love Of war, I choose peace. In the midst of war, I choose peace. In the midst of war, hate and anger keeping score, I will seek. falls down, I will rise. When my world falls down, I will rise. When my world falls down, explanations can't be found. I choose love 
In the midst of pain, I choose love. In the midst of pain, sorrow falling down like rain. First Christian Church of Atlanta. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you for that beautiful song. It's so poignant for this, um, this time. It just seems there's so much negativity and anger out in the world. And I heard every word Ed sang and just inspires me to just stay at peace and stay with a loving heart. Um, if you're watching online uh, or if you're in person, welcome. Um, we have some new people in the house. Uh, we have a gift for you before you leave. Make sure the deacons uh, give you your gift. Now it's time for our first hymn, number 526 in the hymnals, verses 1, 2, and 3. Please stand as you are able. seated. We come to this time of prayer, congregational prayer in which we are both individuals and a body. We come before a Heavenly Father who cares about us and looks after each of our needs and gives us what we need even when we don't quite understand what that means. At this moment, I'd like for us to keep in mind a few things. We have Millie Rivers, who will begin a series of radiation treatments on Tuesday at the uh, young age of 102. She will begin radiation, and it will go on for four weeks every day of radiation. And so please keep her in your prayers. I know she's a little bit nervous about it, but you know she's going to come through all that and, and just keep going. Also... Uh, know that there are many heartfelt cares and concerns among each of you. We want you to know that you're in our hearts and our prayers 
But now let us go before the throne of God together and pray and trust. Good and gracious God, you never fail to forgive us, to wipe our slates clean. But as we receive your mercy, we need to be reminded, reminded of the answer you gave to Peter when he asked the question, how many times should we forgive? We hear your response, 70 times 7. We confess this was not the answer we wanted to hear. We prefer instead to hold on to anger and resentment, especially in those instances where we believe that we have been greatly wronged, far beyond all acceptable limits. But then comes the day we realize that holding on to outrage becomes a prison of despair. What started out as self-preservation changes us from victim into victimizer, tearing down relationships and disturbing the beloved community because we are unwilling to forgive. The same armor that protects us from hurt, pain, humiliation, self-doubt, and vulnerability also stands as a barrier to love, tenderness, authenticity, deep relationship, and most of all, communion with you and with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We need your help because we know that building the beloved community the world needs is to take on Herculean efforts at forgiveness, big, huge shifts, and tiny nudges of our hearts, opening ourselves in ways we perhaps could never even have imagined. Even each movement a step toward the possibility of relationship and reconciliation even transformation for those who have been our tormentors to the broken world around us and even to ourselves. We confess, Lord, that sometimes we do not want to forgive. They don't deserve it, and we can't bear the pain. But here we are again, facing what we know to be true. It's brave and gritty and powerful and freeing to unclench our fist from the false security of resentment, to open our hearts to the possibility of love, to be delighted with a heart miraculously turned from death to life because we had the courage to learn how to forgive. You are the one who, with your last breath, offered to forgive the unforgivable, Therefore, soften our hearts in a way that only divine mystery can invoke. And with a supply of forgiveness greater than we can imagine, help us welcome into reconciliation those who have sought to destroy us so that they may feel what we feel and experience what we have experienced, love, forgiveness, and peace. And now in this time of gathered worship, we appeal to you as many parts of the one body of Christ, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. Gracious God, grant us the yoke of Christ, binding us together, tethered by your love, guided by your presence, and bringing your kingdom into this world. It is for this kingdom that we now pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power,
power and the glory forever. Amen. Please give as you are able to help this church and its ministry serve the community and our Lord. Will the deacons please come forward? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, these gifts are offered in your name for your work as our hands and feet deliver the needs set forth. We pray for your guidance and blessing as we carry out our duties in this ministry. Amen. You may be seated. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we want you to know that you have an invitation to the table, the Lord's table, and it actually comes from Jesus himself. Our churches, uh, the ch Christian churches, Disciples of Christ, is founded upon the principle that this table belongs to Christ, this church belongs to Christ, and everything that we do is in his honor. Therefore, there is no screening process, there's no membership requirement. If you desire to partake of the Lord's Supper, we invite you to come and to partake. We have two ways of doing this. One, the elders in a moment will pray over the bread and the cup, and uh, they will proceed down here, and they will distribute the elements to all who desire to come and to partake. And at this table here, we have what I like to call individual chalices, where you have uh, bread on one end and the, the, the uh, grape juice on the other. And if you prefer a little bit more social distancing, we completely understand and so we have this table here where uh, Jonathan and Richard are standing. At least four times in Matthew's gospel we read that his disciples worshipped him or others worshipped him. Just after he was born, magi from the east came and they worshipped him. In the second and third instances, people worshipped Jesus uh, one of those was where Peter, remember, tried to walk on the water, and he became afraid and began to sink, and Jesus rescued him and brought him into the boat, and it says the disciples worshipped him. And then at the empty tomb, when he appeared to the women who had come there, it says that they worshipped him, and finally, after his resurrection and before his ascension, Matthew tells us that they worshipped him. This is something that we continue in our lives, in our daily uh, lives, also in our worship. We 
uh, will uh, worship Christ by the partaking of the bread and of the cup. And I just realized we have a communion hymn which I have forgotten to announce. So after we sing the communion hymn, which is uh, we come as guests invited, the elders will come and pray over the elements, and then we will serve. Please join me. night when Christ was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray for a special blessing on this table set before you. Bless all who come to your table in your blessed holy name. Our most heavenly and gracious Father, as we partake of your sacraments, we do so acknowledging that the cup not only represent the shedding of your blood, but our inheritance and our cleansing through the blood. We acknowledge these sacraments and agree to the upkeep and keeping of the word of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
for this Sunday is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15, and Luke chapter 6, verses 32 through 36. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15 reads, Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, may your name be rev revered as holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Luke reads, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive payment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend sinners, lend to sinners, to receive as much again. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your rewards will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. The word of God for the people of God.
almost forgot that I needed to preach after that. Thank you for that, choir. Appreciate it. We dismiss the, the youngins now to junior worship with, uh, with the shepherds, yes. All right. All right. Super. One day back in 1996, now think, think back to 1996, where you were, I was about 27 years old, roughly, so just a little less than half of my current age. 1996, I left my church office and walked home for lunch. In those days, uh, I was an associate minister at a church in Fairburn. And, and, and I lived in an apartment at 50 Clay Street in Fairburn. And we had a five-year-old son and another one on the way. Just helping Sam to relate to what's going on here. Anne had recently finished her a degree at Atlanta Christian College. It was basically a biblical studies degree with an emphasis in music. And we were living on my $23,000 a year salary, which even in 1996 was not much, right? I had only recently been able to convince the church that we needed health insurance. And needless to say, these were very lean times for us. So I walked home and sat down to my usual lunch of hot dogs covered in salsa. We ate lots of hot dogs in those days. They were 99 cents a pack, right? And our conversation turned to Ann's job search. There just wasn't much happening in the Fairburn area that matched her skill set. And as you can imagine, she was quite frustrated. And for some dumb reason... I decided to say, well, perhaps I need to find a new job. Which, of course, didn't help her situation at all, but I said it. There we go. So eventually we finished lunch, and I walked back to the church, sat down at my office desk to begin working, and the phone rang. And on the other end of the line was a preacher from a church in Jonesboro. He said that their youth minister was leaving, and someone told him that I might be a good candidate for the job. Let's be honest. I did not want to be a youth minister. I did it. But most of what I had been doing at this, as an associate minister was youth work, right? Working with the kids, directing the programs. But I also got to preach every now and then. I got to go to the hospital and visit people from time to time. So it wasn't just, you know the youth work. It was a little bit of a full range of things. And I kind of looked at that job as sort of like on-the-job training, you know, so that when I got to the, be a senior pastor, I would have had all that experience. But the idea of becoming a youth minister did not appeal to me. But hadn't I just said an hour or so earlier, maybe I'm the one who needs to look for another job, and here's the phone ringing, and I'm thinking, I sent you two rowboats in a helicopter. If you remember that joke, right? So rather than say not interested, I said interested. A couple of weeks later, I had the first interview, and I went to the church and met with the pastor, and, and remember this number, 12 elders. The pastor and 12 elders. Just to give you an idea, we have six elders here at a time. That's our normal number. 12 elders and the pastor. And so I figured that if this wasn't God calling, I, it wasn't going to work out. So I just went there and, and answered the questions as honestly as I could. And then I left and went on my way. One of the things I remember they said they liked about me was that I, in contrast to the person who was leaving, I was a family man. Therefore, I projected a little bit more of a, you know, maybe a mature image as opposed to the wunderkind who, you know, 
did all the fun stuff. So perhaps I was what they needed. Interesting thing happened about a week or so later, there was the, if you remember, the Promise Keepers rallies, you know, and they had a couple of those in Atlanta, and the church in Fairburn had a group that was going, and I, for some reason, didn't make it to the bus in time, so I drove to the MARTA station there in College Park, and I went down to the platform to get on the train, and there was a delegation of elders and the preacher from the Jonesboro Church. Coincidence? Who knows? But certainly we knew each other, and the pastor kind of, you know, whispered over my ear. He says, I, I told them that you're my choice, and they'd be crazy not to choose you to be our, our next youth minister. So I thought, well, things are kind of moving in that direction. You know, what can I say about it? So I went back for my second interview a few weeks after that, and then I was offered the job at, get this, $30,000 a year. Not enough, but it was better than what I was making. So with a family of three and another one on the way, what could I do but accept? So I turned in my notice at the church in Fairburn. I began transitioning to the church in Jonesboro. And over the next 13 months, Ann, myself, our son Nathan, and our son who was born during that experience, Nicholas, experienced some of the most difficult months of our lives. In 13 months' time, we had changed jobs, therefore changed churches, bought a second car, bought a house, welcomed our second son into the world, and found and work in private schools. And if that doesn't sound like enough to have on your plate... Add to it that as, as soon as I came into the office in the church in Jonesboro, the senior minister showed me his other side. I went from being his supposed favorite candidate to the wrong person for the job, almost overnight. From the very first week, he would pull me into his office and lecture me for an hour or two at a time about what I needed to do and how I needed to do it, and why I should buy a house rather than rent an apartment, and why I should do this, and why I should do that. And all of this had to happen right away. In the meantime, Anne is eight or nine months pregnant, right, and so forth. And all this is going on, and we're transitioning. I was very young, about 27 or 28 years old, trying to support a family, trying to keep my nose above water, and nothing pleased him. Nothing was to his satisfaction, nor did we have time to get settled. It was 13 months of pure, can I say it in church? Hell. In my defense, I came into this job and did exactly what I said I was going to do. And I always thought that if you do what you say you're going to do, if you work hard, people will notice it, people will appreciate it. I learned that that ain't necessarily so. Being a family man and being a little bit more serious, I didn't stop taking them on the ski trips. I just balanced them out with a mission trip, you see. I didn't just take them bowling. I took them to a nursing home. They had a Wednesday night program they called Power Praise, and they would invite the local churches to come, and they would have a band to perform. And it was just a time of fun and celebration. And back in the 90s, that was great. You know, that was, that was big time stuff. So I said, yes, I will take it over. But rather than be the center of attention, of course, I'm not a good singer, so that helps in this case. What I did is I did not invite college buddies to come and play and perform and live out their rock and roll fantasies. I took members of the youth group, a guy who wanted to learn to play the guitar, a guy that played drums in marching band, some girls who actually knew how to sing, and a guy who wanted to learn to play the bass guitar. And for a time period, we met and we learned music, and I played the guitar, and I taught him how to play guitar. I taught him how to play bass. Good thing we had a good drummer and, a good, and good singers. And I created a worship team 
out of the members of the congregation, out of the members of the youth group. And then after they learned how to play and gained some confidence, guess what I did? I put my guitar away, and I let them do it themselves, all high schoolers leading worship. And to me, that's what ministry is about. This is what I promised. I said that I would not be the focus of attention, but that I would mentor and nurture the youth, cultivate their gifts, teach them leadership, and involve them in service projects. This was the contrast that they said that they wanted in this congregation. There were some in the youth program that, and some of their parents that really appreciated that because all of a sudden now we had a level playing field and we had people involved and taking a leadership role. And then there were those who were not pleased because they had enjoyed a little bit of special attention. I'm talking about people who live on Lake Spivey, for instance, if you're familiar with that. They decided my approach might have been a little bit too lower middle class for their taste. I don't know. But the senior pastor latched onto this and decided that that was going to be the wedge that he would drive between me and the congregation. And he always was trying to brown nose and infl- I'm, I'm obviously just giving you my side of the story. He's not here to defend himself. But the program had gone in a different direction and you don't give a person 13 months to succeed or fail. You give them 13 months to get settled, you see. So, because the program had gone in a different direction, in contrast to the interviews where I met with the pastor and 12 elders, I was called to a meeting at night with the pastor and only three elders. So to quote Jesus, where are the other nine? (laughs) I learned so many lessons from this experience. And that meeting, by the way, ended in my dismissal, or can I say I got fired? I learned a lot of things about the ministry in that experience, but I have to say it was a very painful experience not only for me, but for Ann, for our son Nathan, who was between five and six years old, and our son Nicholas, who was born in the midst of all of this chaos. And I regret that they had to witness that at such a young age. I think that Nicholas had a rather traumatic entrance into the world as a result of it. We found ourselves unemployed, without a sense of purpose, angry at God, Unemployed, I said already, with a mortgage, a second car payment, and what next? I wish I could say it was all uphill after that, but it wasn't. We struggled to make ends meet. We had to juggle our payments while I looked for a job. I worked temporarily at a trucking agency for a while. You see these big Sia trucks? And the, it, was a, it was a joke. Uh, the guy said, go in the supply closet and count the number of pencils and let me know how many pads of paper we have. And then he said, I'll offer you $20,000 a year just to have another man in the office. You don't know how, you can imagine how humiliating that felt after all those other experiences. We had this one experience where fortunately the boys were visiting their grandparents and because we had no money to pay, we had no gas. And it was time like this or like the weeks we had in the past and they have no idea that we were boiling water on the stove in order to take a hot bath every so many days. Our house was burglarized a number of times and it just seemed that we were doomed for misfortune and I told Ann I feel like the village idiot there's a sign on my back I can't see it but everybody else does. I can only speak for myself when I say that I no longer wanted any part in the ministry, and obviously between then and now, something has changed, right? About a year after I was let go from the Jonesboro Church, I learned that the senior pastor was also let go. But in his case, it was for sexual harassment. 
in retrospect, I can recall some of the things he said to the church secretary. We actually tra transitioned to different church secretary during that time. Things that he said that, in retrospect, I realized were really out of line. More importantly, I learned later on to call his treatment of me bullying, right? It's just that we were young, we were desperate, we were just trying to make things meet, and certainly just couldn't help it. But not only did he get fired from this church for uh, sexual harassment, but apparently a couple years later he found a job at another church where he worked for a year or two until he got fired for guess what? Sexual harassment. In other words, he had a problem. A severe personality issue. About a decade or so ago, I heard that he had died, but I did not hear exactly how he died, and I don't mean to sound like I'm, I don't celebrate that. I'm just saying it just sounded questionable, the circumstances. And the person who relayed the information made it sound like the death came at the end of maybe a prolonged illness of some kind. But what is the point of this story, and how does it apply to our text today? As we have worked our way through the Lord's Prayer, today our theme is forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our debtors or as we forgive those who trespass against us. You see, in all of my anger and resentment at God, at that preacher, at that congregation, at those elders who, who either did what he wanted them to do or they just tried to shut him up, whatever the case may be, Whatever wrongs we have experienced does not make us right in any other cases. I am also a sinner. I have offended others, and yet I want God to forgive me. I hope that as a senior pastor, I have not acted in any ways that he has, but I guarantee you I've made mistakes. I guarantee you that I have or will disappoint you sometime or another. But this is the message that I, this is where I come to at this point. If the risen Christ still bears the scars of his crucifixion, will we not bear the scars of our painful experiences? Me, and Nathan, Nicholas, of that experience in particular. And as a husband and, a, and as a father, it is not easy for me to pass over the fact that my wife and my two sons suffered at their hands. And yet, I ask God to forgive me of my wrongs. How can I ask God to forgive me of my wrongs if I cannot forgive them of theirs? We were greatly tested. We were greatly hurt and even mistreated. Don't we have a right to bear a grudge? And then I read these words from Luke chapter 6, verses 32 through 36. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive payment, and what credit? Nice little pun there, by the way. Is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. Instead, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. You see, after leaving that church in 1997 and living in Jonesboro for another 19 years or so, it is always a possibility that you have to run into somebody in the grocery store, Kroger, Walmart, some other place that did you wrong, and it did happen. 
And I had to realize that in order to be a follower of Christ, I had to be loving at that moment. I had to be forgiving in that moment. And when this man died, do I want him to burn in hell? That's not Christian, right? That means I have to say, if he's in heaven and I want to go to heaven, I better forgive him. Or he might be there and I won't, right? So when we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are not blind to the sources of our pain. Let us also not be blind to the pain that we have caused others. May we endeavor to forgive as Christ forgives, no matter how difficult that may be. I'd like to ask you to stand as we close. Let us say together the words of our vision statement, and then we will sing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, verses 1 and 4. Please join me. We are informed by God's word and inspired through gathered worship to bear witness to Christ through our work in the community and beyond. Once again, a reminder to the ladies, if you would, please hang back for just a few minutes. And uh, Reverend Laney Jenkins and Miss Tremu, I believe, are going to speak with you about the women's gathering, I do believe. And uh, just stay in here, I guess, and, and maybe gravitate to the center. But for, for all of us, a blessing from Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, Happy are those whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.